Thank you for joining us tonight and thank you to all of those joining us on YouTube, maybe not tonight, but certainly in the future. Um, you're here just in time for us to engage with a little bit of Isaiah. That's part of the reason we've all come together is to think about new, a new world, new ways to um, through the lens of Isaiah and we're taking some inspiration from, from Isaiah, which is where I really want to begin today. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see this? She says three, two, one. I can just take some moments to read this scripture to you. Isaiah 43, 19. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do not perceive it. I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in this land. Isaiah 65, 7. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Isaiah 66, 22. As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. I wonder if you could just take a few moments to consider those new things. What is that newness? What, is that new, what might that newness look like for you in your context? What does it mean to build a new world? I want to invite you to breakout rooms um, before we pray together and hand off to Tina just so that you might say hello to each other and you might be able to then tell each other why you're here why you find yourself here this evening why did you sign up um so something what, what does that say to you that scripture in isaiah oh we're all back um i hope that gave you a little introduction to some of the people who are, who are here tonight. Sharon and I had a nice time, um, but got cut off. Three minutes goes quite quick, doesn't it? Um, there'll be other opportunities this evening to be in breakout rooms together. So I hope we can all use them well. Can we pray before we hand over to Tina? Lord, thank you for making it so we can all be here this evening. Thank you for going before us, for being next to us, behind us, above us, below us, within us. Loving God, we pray that we send your spirit in ever increasing ways tonight and as we go beyond this place. Lord, we pray that we hear the whispers of your spirit loudly this evening, that we see that movement. Lord, we pray that you help us together and on our own discern what ways might look like, what that new world that vision might be. Pray this in your loving name. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Tina now. Tina, thank you. you thank you very much. And um, so this is going to be a kind of game of two halves um, or we might actually, given that there aren't um, huge numbers, as I said before, um, the people that are in the room are the people God has called here. So um, you're very welcome um, and we're going to trust that God's going to work with us as we are. But um, we might just play things by ear in the second half and I might ask you um, what you'd like because since there aren't hundreds of us we might be able to negotiate something together but the plan as it stands is that I'm going to spend um, probably about 15 minutes now giving you sort of personal testimony about my encounters with Isaiah um, and how it shapes my ministry um, as a pioneer, an ordained pioneer in the Anglican Church. Um, and then well, around after the break, um, I might share some thoughts about um, Walter Brueggemann's 
understanding of Isaiah. So you'll get something a bit more academic. <laughs> if you're here for knowledge and understanding, then um, then you need to hang on for that bit. And um, yeah, so I wonder how many people here consider themselves pioneers or pioneerish. Um, anybody here who kind of sees themselves as a bit of a pioneer or are you here to find out a bit more about pioneering or are you mainly here to find out just to kind of deepen your understanding of Isaiah it would be brilliant if you could just put in the chat um which of those you might be pioneering uh wanting to find out more about pioneering or interested in Isaiah and then I'll know how to pitch what I'm talking about, hopefully meet some of your needs. Great, thank you, thank you. Got two, yeah, great. Yeah, thanks Sharon, seeing your role as supportive, that's really important. Great. What Kate said, <laughs> lovely, lovely. Okay, well, um, perhaps if I tell you a little bit about um, my uh, background, I'm actually, um, I was a secondary school teacher. Um, I've been a Christian since I was about three and was christened as a Methodist and grew up in the Methodist church. My granddad was a, a lay preacher in the Methodist church. And uh, my closest friend is, um, ordained in the Methodist Church so I still have quite a lot of connections with Methodism and um, I did a degree in German and Russian and um, ended up as a German and Russian teacher in a secondary school and then then I got to be a deputy head uh, over a period of years and then a kind of um, consultant in education and at some point along that line I'd started um preaching in the local church uh Anglican church by now for various reasons I'd sort of fallen in love with um the Anglican liturgy and um yeah and then God kind of called me to be ordained in the Anglican church but I always had this sense that I was called to the church of the future I'd spent the last 10 years sort of in this really quite big thriving successful charismatic evangelical church um and really wanted people to know Jesus but um nobody came to our church in that time um however much kind of outreach we did uh, nothing changed and I started to think I think we need to be doing things differently maybe it's not about them coming to us, but maybe about us going to them. Um, and in all that kind of framing of things, um, there were some really key verses from Isaiah that spoke to me. And as I was kind of a very successful teacher uh, in many ways, quite underconfident actually but from the outside I looked like I knew what I was doing and I was on a kind of trajectory to be ahead and that sort of thing and I had this sense of call from God and a few places I went to I heard the Isaiah 6 passage and um, the passage that says in the year that King Uzziah died I saw the Lord high and enthroned in the temple um, and there's that extraordinary vision of all the angels with their six wings flying around, uh, crying, holy, holy, holy. And that really made an impact on me. And then there's um, Isaiah who, who says, here I am, send me, when the Lord says, who will go for us. Um, and I was there going, me, I'll go, send me. <laughs> um, and around the same time, I had some really extraordinary encounters with God and um, myself, um, unexpected. And in those encounters, God presented God's self to me as vast, um, but not frighteningly vast, beautiful and um, awesome and full. 
Um, and so this description that Isaiah had created and the sense of meeting God in my own spirit um, chimed. And I found myself with this huge desire to make this God known and, and to worship God, but not in the church, really, um, but to kind of create spaces out in the world where believers and non-believers could be engaged in some form of worship or connection with this extraordinary God. Um, and in 2012, which was about four years after I was ordained, it was the Diamond Jubilee. And God gave me this vision of um, inviting the whole town where I was living, which is called Porter's Head, uh, to lunch. Um, which would be a scary thing to do because there are about 23,000 people who lived there. Um, but to cut a long story short, um, the, all the churches in Porter's Head got together and each church created a lot of food. Um, and we invited everybody through the newspaper and the radio and um, the internet. Uh, we didn't ask people to buy tickets or anything. We just trusted that God would send the right number. And I really hoped we'd feed 5,000 people. That was my goal. Um, but we fed three and a half thousand, which I guess was pretty good. Uh, but that sense of scale and that sense of trusting this extraordinary, holy and mighty God um, worked itself out in that um, through that verse, that passage, actually, and in that um, that adventuring, if you like. And around the same time, I got hooked on another verse in Isaiah, which was Isaiah 43, 19, that Katie had on the screen when we came in. Um, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. And um, now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? And um, it seemed to me I was in this big church of beautiful people. And um, I felt like I was the only person who could see this verse. And, and that it was an, in an enormous font, maybe a sort of, font 24 or 48 it felt like it dominated the bible when i opened the bible this verse dominated it like god was yelling i'm doing a new thing now it springs up can't you see it and i felt a little bit like the boy in the story about the emperor's new clothes where it felt like i could see that god was doing a new thing i could see signs of it all around me and other people couldn't, but they were continuing to do the same sorts of things that the church had done year in, year out. Um, and they were sort of on a, on a roundabout, um, I would say a kind of roundabout of blindness, not noticing that there were hundreds of thousands of people outside the church who would never come in and didn't know um, what was going on inside and, and didn't find what was going on inside attractive. Um, so this verse gave me encouragement when I was seeing differently and doing things differently. And there was a time when I was in um, Portishead Head when there was a plan to sort of do the traditional march of witness on the Friday, Good Friday with the cross along the high street. And I remember saying to people, the thing is, nobody's in the high street on Good Friday. Um, all the shops are closed and they're all at home. You know, they're doing other things or they're doing their DIY. They, they'll all be at home base. Um, so what, I mean, we can certainly take the cross out into the public space, but nobody's there. And most people don't understand what we're doing or why. So isn't there a better way of connecting people with Jesus? And so we, we ended up um, doing a car wash in home base on Good Friday, a whole team of people, about 50 people from the church, um, went into the car park at home base and we offered free car washing for anybody who wanted it. Um, and when we'd washed their car, we left a little docket on their windscreen saying, um, behold, you, I am amongst you as one. Behold, I am amongst you as one who serves. Actually, we probably didn't put behold on, just I am amongst you as one who serves. Um, and that, that Jesus had said that. And we just left it as a kind of reminder that it was Good Friday and that, and so we were like washing their cars, which was their main form of transport uh, to kind of reflect how on Monday, Thursday, Jesus had washed their, the disciples' feet, which had been their main forms of transport. 
um, in those days. And that kind of, um, there were people who were really moved by what we were doing, um, asked questions about why all the people in my congregation, I told them they needed to think of an answer to that question. If somebody asked them why they were doing it, they had to be ready to say, and they didn't have to say what I thought they should. They had to think of their own genuine, authentic reason. And so I think pioneering sometimes is like being the boy in the emperor's new clothes that sees something that other people don't see. Um, yeah, so um, then the next passage that has sh shaped my ministry and uh, particularly as a pioneer um, was from Isaiah 40, those words from the Messiah that you probably all know. Um, it, I really had the sense that God was calling me to be ordained as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, that there was, I had a call to be, to have a prophetic voice. And I think that's true of, of quite a lot of pioneers that that sort of seeing differently and then speaking out what you're seeing and speaking out the uh, future that God is calling us to um, is part of that role. And I sort of knew things without knowing how I knew them uh, and then found myself you know, being called to speak them out, which sometimes is quite scary, um, particularly in the church when everybody you know, is really concerned that we speak truth. Um, if you're speaking a truth that other people don't share or don't get, that can be a bit isolating and lonely. Um, but this sense that I've been set apart to be a kind of modern John the Baptist, apart from the way mainstream, it, that was encouraging because once I knew that that was God's call, I could inhabit that. Uh, and it was amazing, really, to think um, the whole vision that there needed to be preparation before in that passage, when God comes, there needs to be a pathway that God can come along uninhibited. So it's the bumpy desert and they have to bring the mountains down into the valleys and level all the land up. Well, that's a lot of work. Um, and as I sat with that passage, I had the sense that before... God can come into the hearts of people and into communities. There's a lot of work we need to do. You could call it pre-evangelism or pre-work. Um, there are all sorts of things we need to do. One is a kind of spiritual task of filling the airwaves with, with God stuff. Um, I, I had this picture that it, around this time I was dwelling with this passage. It was sort of 2004, 2005. They were just about to put ISDN lines everywhere so we could all have broadband internet. And God sort of spoke to me about the, the equivalent today of leveling the mountains and bringing up the valleys was um, sort of cables along which messages can travel really fast. And the way that you kind of create spiritual um, airwaves, if you like. So there needed to be a lot of prayer, um, I did things that would never have results that you would ever possibly be able to see or measure. When I was um, a curate in Nottingham, um, we in the months running up to Christmas, so in Advent, basically, um, a small group of us went out and put Advent calendars in the bus stops because where we I was based, bus stops were the only place where you could um, meet people. Uh, because there was no shops, no, um, there was a school, but we weren't allowed in school, obviously, um, you know, in, unless we were doing assemblies or something like that. But there were really no gathering places. There was no community centre. Um, so the only places people gathered really were the bus stops. <laughs> and so we put advent calendars in, in the bus stops to sort of suggest that this was a time of waiting and to try and provoke people to think what they were waiting for. And every night at midnight, four of us went out with a new advent calendar to put in the in the bus stop. Um, and I'll never know if that made any impact at all. Um, but it felt like it would, because we were asking what people were waiting for, it was trying to kind of get people thinking spiritually. Um, yeah, so... 
that all felt a bit quixotic in a way, but also really important that we were sort of asserting the reality of God and the possibility that God could work miraculously through this rather um, bizarre and possibly pointless kind of expenditure of our time. And, and this other thing about preparing the ground and the ISBN lines, I've used that a lot. Um, how do you prepare the world for God's word to come? And partly it's about building community because there actually need to be gossip lines that the message travels along. So if somebody discovers Jesus, then if they're in isolation, they can't tell anybody else. But if somebody is discovered by Jesus in a community, then their life and their message and their story will impact other people locally. So then I began to concentrate wherever I was on growing community, um, uh, both in the world and in the church. Um, so, and after I'd been a curate and a pioneer vicar in Borges Head, I was recruited to the Diocese of Bath and Wells um, to lead on something called the Pioneer Project. And the Pioneer Project was basically about um, trying to establish pioneering in the diocese, but not top down, not in a top down way, but in a very sort of bottom up grassroots kind of way. So I set up um, hubs where people could come together and learn um, little hotspots of where there were groups of pioneers, say in a particular town, I'd bring them all together to pray together and share ideas and support each other. Um, and then these kind of networks then were places where people could um, share. So whether they were potential spaces for people to share the gospel or for people to share about pioneering, that was all part of the preparation for the work that God will do. And, and then the final passage I just wanted to share with you, um, that's been really profound for me, um, I would say it's probably one of, well, it's probably one of my top three chapters in the whole scriptures uh, is Isaiah 55, uh, which begins, Ho, everyone who is thirsty, come by uh, honey and wine uh, without cost. I'm not uh, quoting it. I meant to go and get my uh, Bible before this session started, but I, there's one over there. I'll grab it in a minute. Um you can be looking up, looking it up for yourself, but Isaiah 55, pretty much the whole chapter. And basically it's a shout to the world to come and get good free food, um, which is a kind of spiritual food. It's not, it's not actual food. Um, but um, I started to think that maybe there was a way of engaging people with God through real stuff um through bread through wine which which we do at communion um and that inspired the big lunch which i told you about before that we did for the diamond jubilee the idea that we could invite people to come and eat free food uh, and be part of a kind of communion meal and maybe through that they would encounter god uh, but we also did something else called the gospel cocktails there was um a um an annual flower show in Porter's Head and um, the church were trying to decide how to engage with people at the flower show in a meaningful way. And um, what we did was invent a set of mocktails, not, they didn't have alcohol in, um, called things like um, forgiveness, life in all its fullness, peace that passes understanding, uh, overflowing joy. And um, we made, we made drinks that tasted like those things. And then we invited, people could come to our, we made a little cocktail bar. People could come and ask for forgiveness or um, peace that passes understanding and we'd give them a free drink. And again, it's the idea that come buy food and drink without money, without price um, and maybe encounter God through it. I've blogged about these. I've got a blog, tinahodgett.net, and you could read about what we did and how we did it there. The other bit of that um, passage that is really important to me is 
the phrase, my ways are not your ways and neither are my thoughts, your thoughts. And it seems to me that as we follow God into the new world, um, we have to be willing to let go of our own ways of doing things. We kind of rely on tradition, we rely on, rely on reason, we rely on things that feel safe. Um, but we're in a really complex situation at the moment where um, the world is changing rapidly and the church will need to be very different in the years ahead uh, for the different people and the different cultures and ways of living. And um, we don't know how to get to that new place. There's only one person who does know, and that's God himself. Um, so we what we need to do in this period of our collective life is just to follow the Holy Spirit wherever she's heading, uh, however bonkers it may seem. And I've certainly been called bonkers a few times in the last 10 to 15 years, but it's something about being willing to lay our own timing for things, our own expectations of results, uh, our own logic on one side and just follow um, where we're being led and I think this will lead us into really surprising places. So I'm a single woman. I've never been married. I've never had kids. And I ended up um, founding a little church um, called Baby Days, which was for young mums who had been pregnant for the first time, had their first baby and were going through that first six months to a year with a new child and all the learning and the, the disorientation that that brings. And I was leading a church of people who were in this space where I'd never been and never would be. And everybody was just a bit puzzled about why that, how that had happened. That's one of those topsy-turvy, unexpected things. And what it gave to me was lots of opportunities to hold babies, which was something I'd missed. Um, and as is the last rather sort of um, crazy thing is that the pioneer project that I led in, in Bath and Wells and um, when I was called into that God said to me go and let the wild rumpus begin and my call into that role was not from the bible but from a book I used to read with my godson when he was little <laughs> uh, called where the wild things are and uh, the bishops allowed the sort of training program around that project to be called the holy rumpus um, which makes people raise their eyebrows a bit. But as far as I can tell what God is uh, saying, that's what God invited me to do uh, and commanded and sent me to do. So there's a few thoughts and um, a few thoughts about how influential Isaiah is um, how how many messages he holds for um, bringing a new world and um, bringing it in new ways that I found really significant in my life. And probably talked for a bit longer than I, I thought it was going to, but that's fine. We're just, well, one of the things I say about pioneering is that we make it up as we go along. I wonder if there are any questions. Um, it, would anybody like to, um, Would anybody like to ask me anything or make any comments? Uh, did I puzzle anybody? Have I been heretical? Uh, did I not give you enough, enough detail? Have I, what would you like, what are you curious about, if anything? Tina, can I ask you to say a bit more about laying aside logic? and what that looks like in reality. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I think we've got very used to controlling and planning. I think that's the era of history we've been through. We've been taught, we've been kind of trained through a period of thinking that we can influence the world. We're, we're powerful people um, and if we want to meet an objective, we can do, you know, I'm thinking about organizations or, um, or um, businesses, you can, you sort of think, well, we want to achieve this end. So we'll, we'll plan, we'll set up our plan. We'll put in the resources, we'll take it step by step, and then we'll, we'll get there. 
Um, and I think in the church, we've been quite used to doing that, to having these programs um, where we think, what do we want to achieve? How do we do it? And, and in many ways, that's great. Um, that's what sensible people do. That's quite a strategic approach. Um, but to do that, we have to have imagined the end result. And we need to imagine different end results. And my my contention is that we can't imagine the results that God needs us to be imagining. So the only way to get from A, the beginning, to B, God's preferred and promised future and outcome, is to follow God on that way. And so laying aside that logic, planning, desire for control, belief that we know what results are needed, that is a bit more like um, what somebody a theologian I like very much calls chasing the rabbit. So you're you're like following the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit can be heading off in a particular direction and you think, oh yes, I know I'm following, I'm, I've heard this Bible story, scripture, that person said this, I've seen that happen, uh, that particular thing that's guiding me thinking that this is the right direction to go in. So I go in that direction and I'm tootling along there nicely and then suddenly all the messages stop and it's like the rabbits disappeared. <laughs> so then you have to wait for, for the rabbit to come back. And it may be that you just need time to think, oh, hang on a minute. I thought we were on a straight route from A to B. And actually, we have to go to B via Z or via X or via P. Um, does that make any sense? It makes a great deal of sense, Tina just kind of affirms and confirms some experiences that I too have had. Great. Yeah, so I hope that's helpful. And are there any other questions? Has anybody had time to think? We've probably got time for one more and then we, we need the promised break. There are no stupid questions, I just need to tell you. There are no stupid questions anywhere in the world ever. So going once, going twice. Okay, I've just got me before. Um, could I just go back to the beginning of this evening session where we saw the quotations that uh, Katie put up? Yep. Is a new heaven and a new earth what we are told about in Revelation 21. Is that effectively the same thing? Uh, yes, I would say so. I would say that um, John, writing Revelation, yeah. in fact, this is a really good segue, Bob, into the next section. <laughs> um, what, what John is doing is going back into the scriptures that he's inherited and knew well and that Jesus would have opened up to them when they were disciples and bringing it into revelation. Basically sort of passing on that message. So for Isaiah, Isaiah was preaching that in 500-ish BC and then John's preaching, he's kind of pass, he's picked up the baton and he's giving it to a community in a similarly difficult situation. They're no longer exiles in Babylon, but they are oppressed by the Roman Empire. And he's saying to them, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. You don't have to accept the reality that you're living under as the eternal reality. There is a different one coming. Now, for us to realize what that implies is it's fundamentally is Jesus is the center of our life and it's Jesus who said who ascended to heaven after his um, resurrection saying basically I'm coming to prepare a place for you as we hear in um, uh, the gospel of John and uh, what I'm really saying is, how much of this can we expect before we go to see Jesus in an eternal sense? 
Well, that all just depends on God's timing, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Jesus said anybody no. who tried to answer that question would be very foolish. So I'm not going Indeed, to. Indeed, yes. But in the, within the Methodist Church, which is only about 250 years old, when John Wesley first uh, went uh, after in that famous session in Aldersgate, that session where his heart was strangely warmed, mm -hmm. uh, he was inspired to go out to the country side on his horse and uh, preach the gospel and take it to the people as we've been hearing tonight yeah and as a result we saw tremendous growth in what became the methodist church that reached a crescendo probably a hundred years ago mm -hmm. but sadly what i observed within the methodist church is it's fading away in Britain, the number of people attending Methodist church services and the type of the number, uh, I was at a, one of our local churches as a church steward um, uh, the other day and they're all over 80. We have lost the ability to attract families in our circuit. What about your circuit? What about other circuits? What, are we, what have we got to do to uh, re get back to um, the uh, Jesus being the centre of all people's lives. Well, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, I mean, the answer to that question is the one that pioneers are trying to answer. Because um, I don't think we're not in the same context as Wesley. Wesley went out to places where there was no, you know, internet or TV. Or oh, yes, yeah, I, 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 or I appreciate that. People, the, are, not, people right. are not going to gather in town squares, I don't think. No, no, no. no an no. itinerant person on horseback. No, no, no. But, um, so what's the equivalent of the 2022 situation to well, bring we, the good news to the people? And I'm absolutely with you here. That's what we've got to do. We've got to reach out. It's no good saying, come and see what we're doing, because they won't, just as you said. Yes. So what is the, in the pioneering spirit, what ideas, other ideas, has anyone got in this group tonight? Well, can I just, that feels like if we started that conversation, that would be, that would take us most of the rest of our session. <laughs> okay, fine, yeah, okay. But, but it may be that that's exactly what we need to be doing because this is what we have to do. The, the short answer to your question, Bob, is one that I've already flagged up, which is yes. that we have to really listen to what, and not just listen, but notice what God is already doing in the world around us, because it's not our mission. It's not for the church to kind of get all active about what it's going to do, even if it could, which it can't, because a lot of them are, a lot of them are full of elderly people who have been very faithful and are now tired um, and elderly. So there is no great... Um, kind of heroic action that we can perform and it's not even about the ideas that people have in this forum it's mainly about um listening paying attention to our own communities so where is God already at work how do we listen to what God is is on God's heart for a space um how do we notice the flows of our own community? How do we join in with what's already thriving in our community? How do we serve the needs that there are in our community in a loving way? Um, and there's a whole journey that pioneers go on and it, it's not quick. It, it takes 18 months if it's that, and that's about as fast as it, you can go because it's about love and about relationships 
So primarily it's about building loving relationships with the people around you and showing that you're trustworthy. And over time, people, a, a community grows and trust grows and relationship and friendship grows. And then people start to be able to ask the questions that they've got, but they haven't got anywhere to ask those questions about matters of spirituality. Yes. Um, so thank you, Sharon. Um, you put in, uh, go to the pub, sit on the prom with a card saying, I will listen. Um, these things are evangelism rather than pioneering. And I think I would, I would agree with you, but I think the question is then, where are you going to take the people who come to faith um, if you're not in a church which is vibrant and easily accessible where people I don't know about you but I went to Sunday school and I learned about Jesus when I was three and for every year since then and for a lot of people if they walk into a church now it's like a foreign world I sometimes say it's a bit like walking into a, an A-level physics class you know they if you've never done physics the words are strange, the way people act are strange, the furniture is strange, <laughs> the expectations of how you behave are strange. So um, what pioneering does is try and create the kind of church that people who are at that stage of growth can belong to and feel is where they're at. So there's a lot about meeting people where they're at rather than trying to bring them to where we're at. Absolutely. Yes, I 100% agree. So can I just check where we're at and get the um, get the opinions of my team members um, about what we should do now? Um, so I'm happy to take a break if um, you're ready to take a break, just a five minute comfort break. For people like that. And then uh, if you can come back Yes, Melanie. Do you know, I think I might have started that that particular, I, I may be being big headed, but in about the year 2001, I remember saying that I'd never heard anybody else say it before, but I'd said it to my church <laughs> that I'd never been in a betting shop. And if I went, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, but yes, that's a really good analogy. Thank you. Um, yeah, so why don't we have a comfort break? And if you can come back at uh, nine uh, eight eight don't come back at nine you come back at eight we'll negotiate what we do for the last 20 30 minutes is that okay welcome back everybody great um i wonder if um would you like to go into just small groups for five minutes and then um, just kind of chat through any particular impressions or learnings or uh, maybe you'd like to share a particular text that's been important for you in your calling from Isaiah so just say five minutes for a, probably breakout rooms of two or three and a quick chat and then I'll launch into a bit of Brueggemann Great. Um, so I'm just going to post this answer to um, Katie to Sharon's question. Well, it's another answer. Um, oh, it's not going. Never mind. I'll do that in a minute. Um, okay. So I've got what I think is about 15 minutes worth of talk on Brueggemann. So I'm. We've kind of agreed I'm going to go with that. I'll try and shorten it a bit. It's more of a preach than a teach. I hope that's all right. Um, anyway, I'll stop explaining it and just go with it. So um, I want to start with um, the act that headlined at Glastonbury uh, on the last day on Sunday. I was watching it accidentally and I'd never seen this man before. Um, but my housemate was watching and she said, oh, Tina, you have to come and look at this. Um, he has an absolutely amazing um, performance. Uh, just extraordinary choreography. He's an incredible poet. He's won a Pulitzer Prize for music. 
his imagination was colossal. Uh, um, if you read the reviews the following day, all the writers, the reviewers are saying it was a groundbreaking set. Um, and he does this extraordinary thing at the end um, where he sort of looks like Jesus uh, on the cross or before he goes on to, onto the cross wearing this crown of thorns and with blood on his face um, and says, your saviour, I am not. <laughs> and, and make of that what you will. Some people will be offended by it and think it's um, demeaning of Jesus and other people might think that uh, Lamar was pointing to Jesus um, certainly trying to say I'm not Jesus I think and uh, after the show I looked up his music on Spotify the online streaming service for music and then um, it turns out that a particular song that I was trying to find has been listened to a hundred million times a hundred million times across the world. And um, at Glastonbury, where there's 200,000 people, there were any number of folk in the audience who knew all the words of his rap songs uh, off by heart. And there are a lot of words. Um, so I was just thinking who in the Christian church can command that kind of audience? Um, and who in the Christian church knows the words of the Bible? or even not in the Christian church, knows the words of the Bible or the Psalms as well as um, those teenagers and um, young people knew this guy's song lyrics. And it made me, reminded me again or drove it home again that um, the church in the UK is in exile, um, like the Israelites were in Babylon. And... Um, People talk about the church being in exile in the West because it's the end of Christendom. And we talked about it being in exile during COVID um, because we were basically shut out of our buildings. Um, but now it's post COVID, ministers in the Anglican church anyway, a lot of them are really exhausted um, with all the efforts to take on new programs, to adapt at speed. Um, and quite a lot of our congregations haven't come back after COVID. So that also feels like the church being in exile, being further and further away from the mainstream and now being on the edge. We're quite weak. As Bob described before, we're marginalised. And I think we're struggling to hold on to our sense of identity and to express that in a compelling way um, in the public space. So... Um, this is where we come to Isaiah, because Isaiah, like some of the other prophets, speaks from a position of exile. The Israelites, as you know, are in Babylon, and um, the Babylonians, they control all the media, such as it was at the time, and it's their culture, and so they determine for everyone who lives within the borders of the Babylonian Empire, what reality is. And the Israelites are being drawn into this version of reality. And the temptation is to forget who they are, who their God is, where they come from, and what they're for, what makes them unique. Um, most of what I'm going to say now is taken from um, Bruggerman's book, the Hopeful Imagination, Prophetic Voices in Exile. And what he suggests is a way of building a new world that, is, that calls upon the imagination. And he says that the way we build that new world is through imaginative acts of prophetic speech. And, and he spends a lot of time in the three chapters in the book about Isaiah, um, raving about Isaiah's gift of poetic imagination. And I kind of referred to some of them earlier and how they shaped my call as a pioneer. And I wonder how many other people's calls um, his, Isaiah's words have shaped, how many people he's caught up in his prophetic vision. Um, and he writes this amazing sentence, um, 
the practice of such poetic imagination is the most subversive, redemptive act that a leader can undertake in the midst of exiles. I think there's a slide for that, um, Michael, if you can find it. Um, the practice of such poetic imagination is the most subversive, redemptive act that a leader can undertake in the midst of exiles. Um, so as the Babylonians are being called, as the Isra Israelites are being called to sort of become Babylonian in their frame of mind, um, this poetic imagination calls them into a new space. Uh, in their in their minds, in their brains, in their imaginations. And what Isaiah does is he captures a vivid and compelling vision of homecoming. So they're in Babylon and he paints this picture in Isaiah 40, which is the passage that I started to read to you. Um, Lo, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And lift up the valleys and bring down the mountains. That's a picture of um, something that hasn't happened yet, but there's no realistic hope of happening, but of God calling his people home. And there being this glorious celebratory procession through the wilderness back to Jerusalem, um, where they will be back in their own place under their own identity. And um, Michael, if have you got that slide? I thought it was showing. I am sharing my screen. Uh, the slides not... are showing. They are showing, Tina. Great. Oh, okay. They're not. They're just not showing on my screen. Oh, I'm yeah. Glad they that. are. They are all showing. Brilliant. Excellent. Um. So, uh, thank you. So, have you got the um picture up of um the reading i wonder if somebody would would somebody like to read this i've i've found it now thank you i've got the slides would somebody like to read that passage for us would you like me to read it thank you comfort comfort my people says your god speak tenderly to jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley, valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cries out. A voice says, cry out, and I say, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. Thank you. We, we won't carry on reading because I'm just conscious of time, but um, there's this passage here. Um, and I love this bit, the grass withers and the flowers fall. And you've probably heard that read at funeral services. And it's not really about grass or flowers. It's about um, how the existing culture and the existing regimes fade away. Um, all earthly power passes and only the word of God, the intention of God and the sovereign will of God stand forever. So what currently seems unchangeable is temporary and then um, through his poetic imagination and courage Isaiah just conjures this image of new possibility and invites the exiles into this reality but to do it they have to take a risk and the risk is to loosen hold on the now on the reality and the safety and security of the now and it might not be what they want but it is at least known it doesn't ask too much of them and they can settle down and be Babylonian and kind of get by. And to invest in a different possible future, daring to hope for something better, it requires letting go of all of that. And um, 
I recently came across this quote by the Jewish philosopher Abraham Herschel. Hope is subversive. It dares to announce that the present to which we have all made commitment is now called into question. I like that so much I put it on my email signature. And Isaiah calls the life of the Israelites in Babylon into question. And this is the kind of thing that uh, Martin Luther King does in his I Have a Dream speech. He paints this picture of homecoming for black Americans. Um, and it's unbelievably powerful. This just this dream speech creates a community of people who commit to a newly imagined world. And they begin to inhabit the new identity, the new sense of self that goes with it. And so that invokes new hope. And that new hope starts a rumbling that shakes the racist structures of American society. The status quo is called into question by Martin Luther King's speech. And there's a little quote there from it, a little bit of his dream that one day one his four little children will live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And so what I'm wondering is, could we be people who, like Isaiah, evoke hope of a new world and that will lead to building a new world through our poetic imagination? Could we shake the foundations of our local communities through prophetic speech? And pioneers are often called dreamers who do. <laughs> um, pioneers are explorers and adventurers. We're pathfinding the way to the future, not just to new ways of being church. And can, can they, can pioneers, can you, can we all boldly share our own prophetic imagination, our dream of what of the world, what the world might be, even when it seems that that reality isn't possible or that no one's listening? And you might think, well, I'm superbly unqualified for that. Um, maybe you don't feel you have any imagination or public speaking isn't your gift. Um, but the thing is, Isaiah isn't just dreaming stuff up out of his own head, like a new Disney film or a work of art, a real work of art. And his imaginative speech, as Bob pointed out earlier, is about going back to the tradition and going back to memories of what God has already done in the past. So he goes back to the history of the Israelites. Um, and he bases his imaginative speech and his imaginative leaps on that. And um, I've recently had an experience like this myself. Last year, I left a really well-paid, secure job. I was in a great team and God called me out of it. And that meant uh, I got less money. So I had to leave the house that I was living in that I really loved and the community that I'd been part of that had grown up over lockdown. And then um, I had to go to an unfamiliar and much less secure setup where I felt a bit lost, um, a bit alone, a bit unseen. And um, I've been reflecting that when you pray the Methodist covenant prayer and you say that God can lay you aside, um, that it's easy to say, but it's quite hard when it happens. <laughs> And you think that nothing will ever be any different. Um, and Brueggemann writes, it's the loss of historical perspective, our reduction of everything to the present moment that results in hopelessness. And I think maybe that's what I've been doing a bit, losing the historical perspective and just thinking that now is the way things will always be. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, I started to make a list of all the amazing ways that God has acted in my life. Um, the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life and God's grace intervening in so many ways. And suddenly I was back in a place of trust. And I could believe that even in the midst of uncertainty and uh, loss, that God is faithful. And it's this process of returning to memory that's the source of Isaiah's imaginative speech. So he draws the picture of homecoming, the return to Jerusalem, um, through key moments of Israel's story. The first one is the story of 
Abraham and Sarah um, when she was beyond childbearing age. Um, one was the story of Noah. Um, so this is referred to in Isaiah 52, I think. Um, the promise that the flood, which is a symbol for the experience of exile, will pass and never come again. Um, and then the third one is the story of David. And it, um, in Isaiah 55, verse 3, Isaiah calls to mind um, the covenant that God made with David and said would last forever. Um, but just as I finish, I want to focus on the story of Sarah. Um, so in Isaiah 54, she becomes the focus of one of these imaginative acts of speech um, that flows out of memory and inspires hope through creating a compelling possibility of a different future. Sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who were never in labour, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, don't hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Don't be afraid, you will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace, you will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. So Isaiah does this amazing thing. He points back to Sarah, who, who is barren, and then she has one child. And he says, let's imagine a world in which she has so many children that her, her tent, her home, isn't big enough. Um, and that, that's an amazing picture, isn't it? And we know that she has descendants and descendants and descendants of whom we are some of them. Um, but this idea that she could be immensely fruitful and also um, when the mention of this woman who has a husband, Brueggemann says that this is a contrast between the slave women in Israel, uh, in Babylon, the slave women who are Israelite in Babylon and the imperial Babylonian women uh, who are married and are freely giving birth. And he says the tables will turn. Um, their fates will be exchanged. So she's, uh, she, uh, yes. So um, Isaiah imagines this new state of affairs in the face of a completely different reality. This reality doesn't exist in the now, but by conjuring up this vision, he enables the Israelites to remember who they are and to hold on to their identity as the chosen people of God. And my hope and prayer in sharing all this is to encourage all of us to be people who try to exercise this poetic imagination for the sake of the people around us. Um, we're not all going to be like Kendrick Lamar and um, command an audience of 100 million, but we have all got communities around us. And I think the act of building anything new, a new community or a social enterprise or a liturgy, in its own way, it's a kind of act of poetic imagination. It's just that that poetry is a poetry in motion rather than in words. And by doing this, we're asserting that another world is possible. It might be another church world or another ecological or environmental world or another economic world, but it will be in God's will, in God's purpose, in God's intention. So um, if I can give you some homework, if we got here a bit quicker, we could have done this. Um, uh, you might like to try this at home. Um, try and write your own piece of poetic speech. Um, and the moves in the practice of these, first of all, accept that you're in exile. Imagine what your homecoming would be to a new world. Base your vision of that possible future world in memory, your own personal memories of what God has done in biblical memory, in your community memory of God, of how God has acted in your community. And then prayerfully, just try and project that into a new place of abundance that's beyond today's reality, um, into a place of God's powerful activity and God's rejoicing and transformation. 
So that's um, that's your task to do at home, <laughs> should you choose to accept, to accept it. And that's me done, um, apart from a little bit of um, advertising. But I'll hand, I'll hand back to the home team for a minute. Tina, thank you so much. Um, thank you for all the wisdom that you shared with us tonight. And I'm sure that it's going to resonate, you know, as we leave from this space. Um, it certainly will for me. I think, you know, reflecting now, I need some more time to, to reflect all that you said, but thank you. And uh, this will remain on YouTube. So if any of us want to revisit once it's been uploaded, you know, we can, we can come back to all that you've said. And yes, well, we will have... Um, an email coming out to you all actually with I think if we can we'll put that slide up Tina or the questions that you just asked um because that would be really useful to what well, you know to encourage you in, in sort of reflective journaling from this point onwards right so in the chat there's um a little bit of signposting but hopefully this will come to you in an email tonight as well um the links at the moment aren't clickable here but they should be clickable when you get them in your email so this is just a little bit of signposting of what you can access what you can get involved in or even if it's just for insight Bob particularly with what you were saying earlier you know if you want to hear a bit more about what's going on across the connection about what's going on in pioneering about the fantastic stuff that are out there the people that are, are getting involved with new places for new people the pioneer support that's out there in the form of for example the pioneer pathways there's other support available um, perhaps sign up to some newsletters uh, these conversations can continue in the, the vast amount of training and events that are going on across the connection regularly. And I'd really encourage you to sign up to your local learning network that if you're not already sign up to their newsletter, perhaps, and you'll see a regular stream of meetings, conversations, events coming to your inbox. And, and whilst we can't attend everything, if, if this conversation has really resonated with you and you don't want that, that to end here and you want to come back, there are so many things going on at the moment where we could pick up this conversation again, not least support you as well to have this conversation in your local context, should you need any support. So there's just some ideas that are, will be coming to you later, but in um, not wanting to take you really beyond the time that we booked together, uh, I'd really just want to say thanks so much again to Tina, to Sharon and to Michael, the host teams, and really thanks so much to you. Um, it's been really lovely being a small group. Um, again, appreciate the time you've taken out of, of life to be here, particularly those who have just jumped from 20 minute, you know, conference 20 minutes before we started. Um, I really hope that this has resonated with you and that your heart has been stirred and that we can all at some point meet again to carry this conversation on and I think details of an, an invitation to continue this conversation will come from the team at a later date so I'd like to end in prayer if I can and just say Lord we thank you for this time that we have spent together for Tina's generosity and vulnerability in sharing with us what you placed on her heart to bring here tonight. And thank you, Lord, for what you've placed on our, each of our hearts and what you continue to stir and to create in us. Lord, we ask you to please continue to embolden us, to strengthen us in your Holy Spirit, to enlighten us with your wisdom, to heal us in all senses so that your mission can be done, Lord in our lives so that we can be those encouragers, advocates, helpers for your mission in the world. We pray this in your precious name, creator God. Amen. <laughs>